Birmingham City Football Club have always been one of soccer's great mysteries. What they've lacked in success has been more than made up for over the years by great teams, great players and great moments. Whatever the division the Blues are in, they'll always be one of Britain's big clubs. And when the good times return to St Andrews, as they surely will, the terraces will echo to the sound of keep right on to the end of the road from their loyal, legendary supporters. Founded in 1875 as Small Heath Alliance, they moved to new headquarters at Munn Street two years later. And in 1882, the Heathens won their first trophy, the Warsaw Cup. 1892 saw them elected to the newly formed second division, which they won scoring 90 goals in only 22 games. In 1905, the club changed its name to Birmingham, and the following year moved to its current home, St Andrews. The early 20s were a great time for Blues, winning the second division in great style in 1921, with names like Liddell, Briggs, Crosby, Hibbs, and scoring sensation Big Joe Bradford. It was no surprise, therefore, when they reached the FA Cup semi-final in 1931. Blues beat Sunderland 2-0 with two goals from Ernie Curtis to ensure a first Wembley appearance against local rivals West Bromwich Albion. Back at St Andrews, the lads got in some vital shooting practice. We'll let manager Leslie Knighton introduce them. Uh, let me introduce to you the Birmingham team. First we have Harry Ibbs, the goalkeeper. Now Errol Booten, a right back. Ned Barkis, who is our captain, at left back. Jimmy Kringen, a right half. George Morrill, the centre half. Alec Leslie, the left half. George Briggs, outside right. Johnny Crosby, inside right. Joe Bradford, centre forward. Jack Firth, inside left. And Ernie Curtis, outside left. It was a hard fought final. Albion broke through to score the opening goal through WG after 25 minutes. But 12 minutes into the second half, Joe Bradford equalised with a 25 yard cracker, which sent the Blues fans wild. It was to be Albion's day, however, as they scored straight from the restart. Richardson scrambling the ball home after a catalogue of defensive errors. But the big talking point with Blues fans was Bob Gregg's goal after eight minutes, which was ruled offside. They were left cursing their bad luck and could only dream of what might have been. Even in the mid-1930s, Blues and Aston Villa were deadly rivals. There's a record crowd of 60,000 at St Andrews to see the clash between Aston Villa and Birmingham. Villa light-sleeved shirts, and it's Villa that opens the score through Astley. Birmingham are undaunted either by this early setback or the new Villa stars, and respond with a determined raid which lets Jones, their centre-forward, through to equalise. From now on, it's a struggle for the lead. Villa takes it with another goal by Astley. And then Birmingham makes it a draw when Jones nets again. All the scoring in the first half. Goalkeeping legend Gil Merrick made a record 551 first-team appearances and was capped 23 times for England. He remains one of Birmingham's favourite sons. You see, going back to the 46 side, which was more or less my first long run, I mean, you'd got players like Freddie Addis, who's captain, Don Dearson, Ted Duckhouse, what a character Ted was. I mean, centre-half, he took over from Arthur Turner. And he, he was a rough and ready fella, Ted was, but he could play. He was one of those stopper centre-halves, you know, never say die. Uh, and Frank Mitchell, of course, started in, the, in that sign. Um, Adel Bodle, George Edwards, great left winger, until he got put on the track at, up at Sunderland, fell at the full-back there put him across the track, and, and I don't think George ever recovered from it. Um, Neil Doodle, what a player Neil Doodle was. I mean, you talk about inside forwards, he must have had two arcs under his uh, skin rather than one. He, he ran himself into the ground every match, like, you know. And then again, of course, there's Jackie Stewart. I mean, Jackie came with a, from Scotland. Nobody knew about him, he came. And he was the toughest little right winger I can remember. And, that was a good side, the, the 46 to 48 side. FA Cup semi-final. For the crowd at Birmingham, for the sixth round tie with Manchester United. In November 1954, former player Arthur Turner replaced Bob Brocklebank as manager. 
Just five defeats from then to the end of the season took Blues to the top of the table. Clown Prince Eddie Brown scored the first goal in a 5-1 win at Doncaster to clinch the championship on goal average. Turner's men played some magnificent football that season, scoring 92 goals, including nine against Liverpool. It is great to see that Liverpool, you know, themselves can get nine against Palace. And when they did get the nine against the Palace, very modestly I wrote to the, and if I'm advertising, to the editor of the Daily Express, reminding him that not too many moons ago, you know, Brownie knocked three in against Liverpool, Birmingham City nine, Liverpool one. And the following fortnight, Port Vale came and we unceremoniously knocked in seven. 16 goals in a fortnight. Have they scored 16 this season here? Well, perhaps. I right, go on then. Yes, Tom. Turning about now to that, that great year. What a great team you've played with. I was the last piece in the jigsaw. Uh, Don Dorman, Arthur Turner came along and, you know, would you like to go up the road? Now, they knew that I could not play centre forward. I wore a number nine on my back. And the last thing that Arthur Turner invariably said to me, Brownie, when you get out there, get on the wing. So I was more or less a right-sided player coming into the middle, not strictly marked, but Peter Murphy, the great Peter, sadly no longer with us, could knock them in, you know, from any angle at all. Better two-footed player, you know, never walked. A great guy, but the idea was, Brownie, you get on the wing, Murphy and Kinsey will go up the middle. Another popular member of that team was Scottish winger Alex Govan. He introduced to the club the now famous anthem, Keep Right On To The End Of The Road, during their memorable 56 Cup run. Going to Arsenal Stadium, the lads had been singing all these English tunes. <laughs> and after ten of the managers said, give us one from Scotland, Alec. And I started singing, Keep Right On To The End Of The Road. And by the time we got to the stadium, the blue supporters were all outside. And the boys were still singing it. We'd sung it about three or four times then, and it was getting very loud when we got to the stadium. And the supporters outside turned it from there. Though the way be long, let your heart be strong. Keep right on to the end. Though we're tired and weary, still carry on till we come to a happy abode. Up hey. the blues. Hey, brilliant. That takes Up me the blues. That was obviously the semi final. I think that was the highlight of me Birmingham career. I mean, internationals, forgetting those. The semi final was the best match I can remember. And, it was a marvellous feeling when you knew that she was going to the final. Game, the best game that I have ever played in. Tapper Wiseman, who was then vice chairman, was he not, and co-selector with England, said to me after the semi-final, Brownie said, if you can do half as well at Wembley, I was in for a cap against Brazil the following week. But sadly, the, the Wembley occasion was a little bit too much for me. Mum was there, the family was there, royalty and the rest of it, you know, and I spent more of my time in the stands than on the pitch. But, uh, as I said earlier this morning, Tom, I would like to go back to Wembley every year and lose. They took us away from here on the, uh, on the Thursday, I think. Uh, they brought us back sometime the following Monday, never got our hands in our pockets once, you know. A wonderful weekend, and I can still hear as we walked into the Park Hotel after the game, the band playing, not miserably, very confidently, here's to the next time. Magnificent, really. There it is, still unwashed, still stained with champagne, tears, or whatever it, but um, as a shirt again, a little story, um, uh, and I'm sure one Harry Parks will not be too disappointed when I say that um, uh, for the Monday paper, I think it was, Tom, the guy said, and, uh, you know, why did you fail in the final? Well, I said, whereas they had the V-neck, the short sleeve, I said, we came out in this long sleeve, in this tie, in, in this collar, all it needs really, you know, is this kind of tie, and we were, you know, dressed for dinner kind of thing. So I said, imagine that, wet through, you know, in the Wembley cauldron, 
multiplied by 12 players over 90 minutes and I think it wor worked out that we were carrying about 300 weights more than Man City at the end of 90 minutes and so a little bit with respect to Birmingham and apologies to Harry Parks you know the shirt was but as a memorabilia you know you can't take it away I will never part with it and the thing will never be washed. If Blues had been favourites to win the 1931 Cup final, they were odds-on to win in 56. But sadly, once again, they fell at the final hurdle. It had been a great run, with the Birmingham public turning out in force to welcome them home. That great season also saw Blues finish in their highest ever league position, sixth in the first division, behind the champions Manchester United, to whom they lost in the FA Cup semi-final the following year. Speedy winger Mike Hellowell was amongst new players brought in during that year to try and maintain Blue's success into the 60s. I joined the club in 57 from Queen's Park Rangers when I was 18. Yes. Who signed you? And, uh, Arthur Turner signed me just after they'd been to Wembley in 56. Took you a bit to get your place though? Yes, uh, I got my permanent place when, when Harry Hooper was uh, transferred to Sunderland. And uh, I think Gil Merrick became manager and, and I became a regular in about 19... About 1960, yeah. Your biggest strength, I, of course, your speed. Yes, it was, yeah, yeah. Yes, in those days, I could stay on the line and use my speed whenever I could, whenever it was possible. And your two England caps? Yes, yes, I was capped twice in 1962 when Walter Winterbottom was team manager. The late 1950s and early 60s were times of mixed fortunes for Birmingham City, with genuine joys and sorrows too. The tragic death of brilliant international fullback Jeff Hall at the age of 29 from polio was a blow that sent shockwaves through the football world. Well, Jeff started in front of me as a youngster, and he gradually improved. Um, and when when he went, it was a, it was a, a terrible thing, because I think he was just coming to the peak. And um, as I say, it was a, a terrible blow. No one expected anything like that at all. When they'd been one of the pioneering British teams entering the European stage, with two appearances in the Intercities Fairs Cup final in 1960 against Spanish giants Barcelona, and in 1961 against crack Italian side AS Roma. But it was this success over Villa in 1963 which finally bought Blues a major trophy, skipper Trevor Smith holding the League Cup aloft for their ecstatic supporters. Birmingham played really well. Villa, I think they've got a couple of reserves in, but uh, I don't think it would have made any difference really, you know. We, we was, we'd have beat them anyhow, you know, I'm certain. Then we had to go back to Villa Park and we managed to hold them to a not not draw. And they put us under a lot of pressure at Villa Park, mind, you know, but uh, we, we, we sailed through it really, you know. Great win for you, oh, must have been good fantastic. for you. Fantastic, great it was. It was nice winning a trophy at Villa Park for another club, I'll tell you that. <laughs> now you had five fabulous years at Birmingham. Fabulous, yeah, I fell in love with Birmingham City, I did, you know, there was a great club. It was fantastic. And when you come out here and you've got this atmosphere to train in, it was fantastic, you know. I used to love coming here, you know. Gil Merrick stayed for only one more season following that League Cup triumph, leaving the club as their most successful manager to date. In the mid to late 60s, Blues had their ups and downs. They returned to the second division in 1965, where they were to remain for the next seven seasons. They did, however, reach the semi-final of the League Cup in 1967 and the FA Cup in 1968, losing out to West Bromwich Albion after beating Chelsea with a Fred Pickering goal in the quarter-final. Striker Phil Summerhill claimed a regular place in the side the following season. When I came to the club, we had players like Jimmy Bloomfield, uh, Harris, Leek, Hennessy, Ald, a number of players, international players. Um, going on then to when I started again the team, players like uh, Hockey, um, Murray, Bridges, Pickering, and probably the, the player I ever, best player I ever played with was Jimmy Greenough. 
Now you for three seasons were top scorer. Great years for you. Great years. Uh, local lad, always supported Birmingham City. Go back as far as the 56 Cup final, all the Intercities Fairs Cups. Remember the very good days of Birmingham City. Stan Cullis spent five years at St Andrews trying to repeat his success at Wolves. But despite two semi-finals and an attacking style, indifferent league form led him to step down to make way for a younger man. Look at Joy's hard work. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, Freddie Goodwin arrived from Brighton in 1970 and immediately made his intentions clear. I believe in attacking football. The public want to see goals. Uh, we will endeavour to entertain them, but primarily, of course, we've got to be successful. Now, the season's, what, a month away. Can you envision Birmingham having a good season? Uh, I would never prophesy, uh, Bill, about how we we're going to do. Um, I think we've, we've got a hard season ahead. There are many good teams in the second division. Uh, if we're not successful, it won't be for the want of trying. Among Goodwin's squad was a 16-year-old striker trying to claim a regular place at number eight. 15 goals in 13 games certainly helped. I played with three strikers, uh, Phil Summer on the right, Bob Latchford up front, and me on the left. You've had 14 games with the first team now. This was your 14th. Yes. Do you feel now that you're fitting in as part of the line? Yes, I think some more now. At first, you know, it was a bit strange coming to the side, you know, being so young. He was uh, a great team then, you know, we had some good players and uh, it was great to play up front with, with Bob and Trevor because uh, when I arrived at the club, of course, they were uh, relatively young, in inexperienced players. And I joined them as a, a pro who probably had 300 games under his belt anyway at that stage. And I think Freddie bought me to complement uh, the two lads up front. The young Francis really was something special. Yeah, I mean, Trevor, I always say, or people say to me, yeah, but what made Trevor Francis special? And I think he had the combination of um, deception and speed, i.e. he could drop his shoulder one way and then dart off the other. A lot of players can do one of those things, but very um, infrequently have the two. Been here now at St Andrews, the memories come flooding back and you know these stands used to be full of blue and white scarves, rattles and bells and rosettes. It used to be fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great moment of nostalgia to me to come back to, to Birmingham City. But um, yeah, they, they were fun and away from home as well, away from home. I mean, we always thought we were playing at home, you know, wherever we played in the, in, in the country. Uh, they were there supporting us and uh, as you know, Tom, I mean, uh, many a time the gates have been shut at half past two at St Andrews. Bobby Atten used to do all my running for me. I know that I used to get him to do all my running. I used to just get him the box. Uh, used, with Trevor, we just used to give him the ball, say, Trev, just get on with it. And <laughs> you'd just give him the ball, go up the park and score. But I, there's no real big secret apart from just playing together um, and being together week in, week out and getting to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and the three of us really did just gel together. Um, you couldn't have asked for it a better threesome um, in your life if you needed to pick out three players to say, look, go and play up front and score goals. Um, you couldn't have asked for, for, for it to have worked any better. Undefeated in the league since January the 1st, Blues roared up the table to clinch promotion, reaching a semi-final against Leeds on the way. But it had been nail-bitingly close. It all hinged on the last match at Orient. 30,000 people plus packed into Leighton Orient, small, small compact ground. Um, some 12, 15,000 Birmingham City supporters uh, created an unbelievable atmosphere. I mean, that night we had had um, bomb scares, we'd had Millwall supporters invading the pitch and dancing around the centre circle. And uh, funny enough, I remember at that time going over to the referee and saying, listen, ref, we've got, he said, don't worry, son, uh, we'll play all night if we have to, we'll get these off. Which, which gave you a little bit of confidence, because I always felt we were going we to get something. I always felt we'd win that game. Welshman Malcolm Page, Birmingham's most capped player, was part of that promotion team. We did seem to have this relationship with one another where, you know, we knew what, uh, what was going to happen and, uh, and um, it, you know, that, that seemed to be uh, how it went. 
that relationship stretched to the fans as well, didn't it? A great relationship with sure, the fans. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, wonderful set of fans. Um, uh, I mean, looking back now at some of the crowds that we've had here and the occasions, um, and not had the success uh, to give uh, the fans, you know, but um, wonderful times. We all tend to look back a little bit with the old rose-tinted spectacles, perhaps, but um, wonderful memories and, uh, you know, never to be forgotten, not only for the players, but for the fans as well. An outstanding young defender at the time was Joe Gallagher. He had a knack of scoring vital goals like the one at Hillsborough in the heartbreaking semi-final against Fulham in 1975. Every time people talk about that, you just reminded me about it again, Tom. It's uh, a desperate, desperate feeling. Desperate things come over you. I know it's uh, it's only a game ultimately, football. But for for Birmingham City supporters, uh, and I count myself amongst them, lucky enough to be amongst them, and lucky enough to play for the club, it was a desperate disappointment. Again, I think we took some unbelievable support. I think it was perhaps twenty odd thousand people we took north um, that night. I think, I think it's fair to say. Um, we played very, very well. We played very well. I know that I went back a, a central defender alongside Joe, and I felt that uh, I am professional. I've always been a professional. It was one of the better games that I'd ever had for the club. Uh, Mellor had a great time for Fulham. Uh, we just couldn't score, we couldn't score, we battered them. We didn't look in any trouble at the back. Uh, we turned around, no goals at half time, no goals at extra time, no goals into the second half of extra time. And then perhaps with what, 15 or 20 seconds to go, I think they knocked a ball in from the right, and I don't know, was it Mitchell or somebody like that got on the end of it. It bobbled off his chest. It went, it went by Big Dave. Dave tried to get it. Joe went, fell over him, and it was unbelievable. It was all the, the earth had stopped. The ball just rolled in the back of the net, and all I can remember then was falling on the floor. I fell on the floor and I looked round, and there were a few other people fell on the floor, and it was silence. I mean, there were a few, a few thousand Fulham people I think cheering, but Birmingham City people were silent. I think we went back to the halfway line, kicked off in the ref blew his whistle. And my biggest thought from then on, I can remember now, I just ran off the pitch, I ran straight away into the dressing room and I locked myself in the toilet. I don't think I came out for quarter of an hour. Coach Willie Bell replaced Goodwin soon after, and his new signings, Gary Jones and John Connolly, soon won over the fans against Aston. Six seventy seven season proved a personal triumph for Trevor Francis. He was ever present with 21 goals, earning him his England place. In the return match against Villa, there were some crude attempts to stop his flowing runs. During the double over Villa, Birmingham only finished in mid-table that season. And after losing their opening four games of the 77-78 campaign, Willie Bell was sacked, and club director Sir Ralph Ramsey took over, becoming the first knight to manage a football club. Ill health forced his retirement in March 1978, and Blackburn's up-and-coming manager Jim Smith was invited to take over the hot seat by chairman Keith Coombs, who hoped he could revive the team's flagging fortunes. His first problem was to persuade spy-on cop favourite Trevor Francis that his future lay at St Andrews. Um, I've never had any problems with any player while I've been a manager because I, I'm, I'm a player's man, really, and I think I can communicate with them and get them on my side. And This is what I've got to do with Trevor, and uh, I hope that I'm going to be successful in... in showing Trevor that we're going to be successful because I think that's what he wants. He's an ambitious man for success, not, not financial reward at all. And I'm the same. I want to be successful and I want to work hard to be successful. And I want Trevor Francis playing with Birmingham City when we are successful. Do you feel that having that million pounds tied around your neck will be a burden in your playing career now? Initial optimism fell away um, with a run of poor that, results um, and Francis moment. finally had his wish uh, to leave granted. Brian Clough offering him the chance of success he so richly deserved. The compensation for Blues was £1 million, smashing the British transfer record. And when do you expect to play your first game for Forest? When I pick him. With Francis gone and morale low, Smith's first full season ended in relegation. It was clearly time to rebuild. Gambling on experience, Smith secured Archie Gemmell from Forest for £150,000. He was followed by former England international Colin Todd from Everton. The arrival of the classy Frank Worthington immediately gave the cop a new hero to replace Trevor Francis. Well, I mean, that's, it's nice to be mentioned in the same breath as Trevor, who's, who's done, you know, who's done magnificently for Birmingham City uh, on and off the field. So, uh, you know, that is a compliment to me. So, uh, you know, but uh, I can only say that uh, uh, the feeling was reciprocated.
Did I get that right? <laughs> Reciprocally. <laughs> the feeling was reciprocal. <laughs> it was, uh, the feeling was mutual. That's good. <laughs> Jimmy Smith, uh, he, he wanted that in his team. And, uh, you know, it was a very enjoyable side of playing. It still annoys me, though, to this day that Smithy uh, left me out the uh, the promotion game the actual day uh, when we did get up against Notts County. And uh, I'll never forget it. We, we got back in the dressing room after the game and, and nobody knew, uh, you know, whether to laugh, cry or, or whatever, because uh, uh, I think everything hinged on the Chelsea result. And uh, anyway, it eventually filtered through that, uh, that we'd gone up. But uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a, a strange moment then, although... Uh, Obviously, uh, a very happy one, uh, ultimately. Ron Saunders was brought in by Keith Coombs as a last desperate gamble to bring success to St Andrews. To Division 2, inevitable. That was probably my best season in football. I think I scored nine or ten goals, which is a lot for me. And I was playing up front with Mick Harford, and we had, we had Tony Coton and Noel Blake, some great players. And I always remember that season, because I think it equaled the record number of away wins for the club for anybody, I think, which was 13, I think. A difficult team to beat Birmingham City in that year? Um, yeah, I think majority of games we won 1-0 in the last minutes, especially away from home. But in the second division, you know, as long as you get up there and get back into the first. Uh, we were going out and people were expected to get beat by us. They were going out, you could see the fear on their faces because we had such a good, a good team. And Saunders gave that impression that, you know, that uh, we could beat anybody. And he had that sort of air about him. You know, just even getting off the coach and that the fans would see him and the, and, and the opposing players, I'm sure, saw him and think, cranky, you know, I mean, I'm, he was a top manager. You've had hundreds and hundreds of league games to your credit, but you've got this fabulous love affair with the Birmingham City fans. Yeah, I think they, they've enjoyed all the goals I've scored. <laughs> <laughs> it's none in six years, it's, it's pretty impressive, really. Uh, I mean, I was going to say I'd let my goals do all the talking, but, you know, you don't want somebody silent on here. So, yeah, they, 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 I think they realise that I'm not over-talented, but I, I give all I've got and they can associate with things like that. And uh, there's nothing worse than being one of, the, one of these guys that, that got uh, skill in abundance, but doesn't try, and they, they, they soon spot that. I mean, the fans are no mugs, they soon spot people like that, and they take a dislike to them. Uh, and then, on the other hand, when they see somebody giving everything they've got, like, they go for them, and it, it did me a world of good. I mean, it really did. It was, it was a fantastic feeling, going out and singing your name all the time. And, uh, it, you know, it makes me, big enough as I am, but it makes me feel 10 foot tall you know, with the fans. And, you know, they, they, they showed it in, in picking me for Player of the Year last year, and uh, the London branch gave me the Player of the Year as well. So it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Off the pitch, Blues were in a terrible financial state. Chairman Keith Coombs had had enough handing over control to local entrepreneur Ken Weldon, who'd already performed economic miracles at Warsaw. On his first day at St Andrews, he spelled out the problems the club faced. But I fear that Birmingham City Football Club is in dire straits. The problems weren't only in the boardroom. On the pitch, a demoralised Blues were fast heading towards the second division. It turned out that Ken Weldon had arrived in the nick of time. Well, it was apparent that they were considering calling in the receiver. And I quote from the minutes. The meeting commenced with a lengthy discussion on the club's current financial position. It was felt that 500,000 would be necessary to reconstruct the club's finances. And if no further solution was forthcoming, suggest the bank call in a receiver. In fact, they owed in excess of three million pounds. And uh, I thought it was a challenge and it was quite out of order to sit and see Birmingham City go under. I took the club over on the Monday at 11 o'clock in the morning and I arrived at the club at 12.30 to find all the players on the stairs who had not been paid the previous fortnight's wages. So the first thing I had to do was put my hand in my pocket and find £50,000 immediately. There was a number of buyers and uh, one had got to weigh up whether or not there was interest in football or development and I reached the conclusion that the Kumars football-minded people was the people for the job. The Kumar brothers arrived too late to prevent Blues slipping into the third division for the first time in their proud history, but they readily accepted the challenge. The rebirth of the Blues was underway. 
I hope to bring a different attitude to Birmingham City and an attitude where if you look at the grandeur of this stadium, there's tremendous facilities. There is no excuse that as long as we are able to relate back to our supporters who have a very strong affinity for this football club. This football club, I feel, can be up there with the big five, no problem. The terms of support, the support is definitely out there. But over the years, that the support and the club themselves have um, the severed ties. And I think it's, it's a very big part and in, an important job for me now in the future to bring those supporters back to the football club and generate the facilities that we've got at this football club to generate the finances that in the future, and it may take three, maybe five years, that in the future we have a sound financial footing where not only we're able to retain our better players but compete in the transfer market with the better players yet again. When you arrived at the club that first day, that first week, what, what were your feelings? What were the sort of problems you faced? Well, I think um, it was very typical of what was happening on the pitch. There was very, very low morale. Um, the players themselves, they were frightened to be picked on a match day. Um, the crowd obviously were giving them a bad time because they've been relegated now for the first time in the 114 year history. And it was a very big problem basically to, to lift morale and install a newfound discipline and confidence and enthusiasm about, not just on the playing side, but also of course behind the scenes because it, uh, if you have panic and, uh, and lack of enthusiasm and lack of morale, it tends to fester right the way through the football club. When we interviewed Dave Mackay, literally within 15 minutes, he was offered the job because within the 15 minutes, he imposed upon myself that his main concern was to bring an attacking, attractive team at St Andrews. He wants them to go out on that pitch and express themselves. And it doesn't just stop with the star strikers. It's, it goes all the way through the team, whether you're a fullback or a centre-half. If you've got the ability, you do the positive things and you express yourself and you enjoy a game of football. I think people, the supporters of Birmingham City, will feel that the flair and the enthusiasm is coming back to St Andrews, which I think it has to a certain degree this season. This is the main reason why we installed Dave McCoy, because we feel that he, he preaches the pure football. Well, I love to see good football, you know. I love to see the Liverpool style. Everybody loves to see that and wish they were Liverpool. But there's only one Liverpool in the country. And uh, But we would like to be able to think that we could get somewhere near them. When you were a player, Dave, in your, in your heyday with Spurs, what were your impressions of Birmingham when you used to come here with Spurs? Well, I, the, the one thing that I remember very much, we had a 3-3 cup tie here after leading 3 nothing, and they scared the pants of us in the last 10 or 15 minutes when they actually, Harris scored the goal, thought we had lost it. 3-3, uh, we won the replay, but tremendous crowd that was here and always on the far side, on the right-hand side, with tremendous support that Birmingham's got. In the past, Birmingham City, when it's had good youngsters, has sold them. Are you going to be in that position? Well, I think anybody that, when it comes to buying and selling, you've got to say, if you're offered a certain amount, like half a million for one particular player, do I think he's worth that money or don't I, you know? And if you're going to get that sort of money, I've got somebody else in the back of my mind that's actually, I think, is better than that player that was selling. But we won't be selling players just for the sake of selling them. You sell your good players and you'll be in the fourth division. You uh, hadn't been at the club long when you uh, got Bobby Ferguson to join you. What are his qualities? Uh, well, he's an excellent coach, brilliant coach, and he keeps on the players. He keeps the players on their toes, and uh, he does give them plenty of stick. And uh, I think he's another one like Bill Shankly. If you ever met Bill Shankly, all he would talk about is football. Um, but he knew the business, and, took, and so does Bobby. <laughs> Yeah, you're quiet with some of them and you're, you're noisy with other ones, you know, they need stirring up, you've got to stir some up and you've got to calm other ones down, you know. Some are pretty pretty much tensed up, others are a little bit too relaxed, so you're, you're trying to weigh the pros and the cons up and treat each one each one in, in, individually, really. You're also a strict disciplinarian, you like disciplined footballers. Yes, I think without spirit and without discipline, your team's got nothing. Without spirit, they're the two. they the two things are omnipotent. They, 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 you know, they, you can't do without them. You can have skill as much as you like. If you've got no spirit and discipline, you've got nothing. It will collapse on you. The reason I'm in the game is because I love it, really. And so when you love it, you, it's a passionate game played by hopefully passionate people. And uh, so I mean, obviously, you can't just keep your mouth shut. You know, you've got to live and live every kick. Really. 
Samesh Kumar's desire to make blues a family club saw a quick reintroduction of the junior blues. Two main aims, I suppose. The one would be to uh, hopefully get these young supporters uh, following Birmingham City and once having started here, want to follow them for the rest of their lives. And secondly, a little part of me that uh, detests what we see sometimes happening on the terraces at football clubs and hoping that the youngsters coming through will also detest it and behave in a bit, bit, bit of a better way. The club was determined to become more in touch with the local community. Part of the plan involved the probation service. They got in touch with us and asked if some uh, young children could come along who come from broken homes and are young offenders and could they be of uh, some assistance with you know, uh, some work on the ground. So we find them small jobs, small tidying up jobs where they, they come along and uh, you know, we give them a drink and what have you and they, uh, they seem to enjoy it. Did the probation service think it works? I think so, yeah, because while the, the boys are here, we have a ch uh, chance to chat to them and, you know, ask them, you know, wh what have they done and, uh, you know, hopefully we can put them on the straight and narrow. Another part of the community project involves taking the club out to local schools. Good. Not too bad. I think it's coming now. Well done, Gareth. Well done, Anthony. Good. That's it. Well done. Good one. Not only will the kids benefit from the coaching, but the club is fulfilling the chairman's promise to forge stronger links with the local community. There's a lot of soccer schools about where they're paying 30, 40 or 50 pounds a week and all we're charging is 50 pence a day. So but they can get good training, you know, and it brings it back to the, to the community, to the kids that perhaps wouldn't normally uh, afford it, which I think is great. There's a lot of talent about that, uh, that probably would have gone unnoticed. We've got one lad who comes to soccer coaching on a Saturday morning who's actually going for uh, goalkeeping trials with the club. Um, and we brought that to the attention of the club. So perhaps, and perhaps from the, if the, uh, some of these kids can go on to be professionals, there's bound to be, out of these numbers, there's bound to be one or two percent will get through and become footballers, I would think. Yeah, what we'd like to see is the sessions that we do offer, maybe there may be some young stars that may become professional footballers with Birmingham City, and we found them through our coaching schemes. Any youngster making the grade comes under the wing of youth team coach Fred Davis. His record of bringing through youngsters for the first team is second to none. You've got Sturridge, you've got Yates, you've got Peer, you've got Tate, you've got Clarkson. Uh, Frayne is in the uh, in the youth has come through the youth policy, and Kevin Ashley has come through the youth policy. Do we get more than our fair share at Birmingham? I think we've done we've done quite well over the uh, over the time I've been doing the job of uh, about two and a half years now um, with the young boy Rutherford who, who's had two 20 minutes in the first team. Um, there's been 11 boys gone in. What's the react the relationship between you and the, the the boys? Is it like almost like father son? Well, it is. I kick backsides, Tom. Obviously, you've got to have a little bit of discipline with them, but uh, I always put my arm around them. After I mean, at, at this present time of talking, it's it's been. Uh, a difficult time in terms that I've had seven second year boys who have just come in up to whether they're getting signed pro and I've told the boys this morning we're taking three of them which all right the other four are very disappointed but I'll do what I can for them and one boy's already been to another football club and had a week's trial and there's another boy going out next week on a week's trial so I'll do what I can to to uh, to ensure that they you know they have trials elsewhere as well Who are the youngsters that are coming through now that you think have got a good chance of it? Uh, a boy by the name of Francis, not, uh, not Trevor, <laughs> but he's another strike.